Well, thank you very much to our worship team, and it's such an awesome thing to be able to worship together. I can't wait till we can do this all in one room. Let me figure out how I can raise this up. Here we go. So if you guys want to open up your Bibles to James chapter 4, we're going to take the first uh, 12 verses, and uh, I've just been so blown away by the book of James. I hope that you all have been blessed by it as well, and uh, this, this, this book is just really confrontational in so many ways to our faith, what we believe, really hitting us in terms of not just what we do and how we act, but really what's at the heart, and that's what this text is about, because you know, we are in an age of quarrels and fights. You go on social media, online, turn on the TV to any news channel. It is constant fighting everywhere. And what is at the root of that? What is the root of that fighting? And of course, there's fighting even within our own homes sometimes. Siblings fighting with one another and spouses fighting with one another. Again, what is at the root of that? Because here's, here's the thing, you guys. Um, sin is like a dandelion weed. It's, it's not enough to just trim the leaves off of that uh, dandelion to kill it. You have to actually dig into the root in order to kill that weed. It will, it will come back unless you get the root out of it. You know, because it's, it's like with a child. You know, if a child hits his sister because she steals something from him and he's angry and he hits her because she ta- he, takes, he takes it back. Of course, as parents, we want to teach the child to not hit people. But have you really done your good job as a parent if that's all you teach a child? What's behind that sin of hitting someone? You know, selfishness, lack of love and generosity towards other, envy, jealousy, uh, you know, all those kinds of ideas. Those are the roots of that sin. Because, of course, we don't want a child just to grow up and learn to not hit people. I know lots of adults that struggle, including myself, with envy and coveting and those heart-level sins that lead to the fruit of hitting other people, again, as a child. But, so here's, here's the big question that I think this text answers. How do we rid ourselves of sin at the root level? How do we rid ourselves of sin at the root level. Let's just jump right into the text. Verses one through three tell us that we need to ID the real problem. We've got to identify the real actual problem. Let me read those first verses. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not ask because you, or you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So the real problem is, the, is at the root level. It's at our heart level. It's our passions. It's our desires. And, and James is saying that it's not enough that you stop fighting other people in the example he's talking about, but you've got to dig out the root of what those problems are. Again, because again, if you just stop the fighting and the quarreling, then all you've done is pluck the leaves off of the, the dandelions. If we're going to kill sin... We have to kill it at the root. So we've got to ask ourselves some hard questions, you know, like, what was I feeling when I I did that thing? In other words, when, when people saw the fruit of what was inside my heart, what was I feeling? What was I desiring? What was I really trying to get after? You know, and that's something that, you know, to think about, too, is, is, you know, get somebody in your intentional relationship, somebody that's close to you, to help you dig at trying to find what is the heart-level passion, the heart-level desire that was leading to that sin that we, we see. And so ask yourself the hard questions. Let other people ask those questions and dig out that root. So second, how do we re- rid ourselves of sin at the root level? We need to see the root sin the way God sees it. We need to see our root sin the way God sees it. Look at verses 4 and 5. He says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? 
Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? And and James uses a couple of really provocative and powerful words in these two verses, adultery and jealousy. Now, those are words that we hear and understand within certain kinds of, you know, marriage and romantic love relationships. But all throughout the Old Testament, the relationship and when when Israel walks away from God, it describes them as adulterous, as committing spiritual adultery. And and we learn from the Old Testament that, that God is a jealous God because he demands to be the only God. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. And of course, we we know later that Jesus sums up the entire law by saying that you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. In other words, it is completely appropriate for God to be jealous of our love. You know, because think about it like um, the relationship that I have with my, my wife. It's completely appropriate for her to be jealous of my love. It's completely appropriate for me to be jealous of her love. It's a relationship that God has designed to be exclusive. Same thing with our relationship with God. He expects to be primary. He expects to be the exclusive and one God. And those heart level sins are about our desires and our passions that often are pursuing other things rather than than God. And that's why God describes it as jealous, that he is jealous. And then it also takes us back to verse three. Look what he says. You ask, you did not receive because you asked wrongly to spend it on your passions. I mean, can you imagine how offensive would it be be for me to go to my wife and say, hey, could you clean up the house and prepare a really nice dinner? And then if you could take the kids out of the house because my mistress is going to come over and I want to spend a nice evening with her. That's what God's saying, that a lot of times we're asking God for him to give us good things so that we can go and love that other God and not serve and love him. He said, I'm not going to answer that request because that's what's behind your, your passions. Now, we have to feel that sin the way God feels it. We have to see and understand the sin the way that he sees it. And I hope that we can really feel those heart level sins deeply. But here's where it turns to, I think, obviously some great hope because because you've identified what the sin is. It's like, okay, I'm going to ID that sin at the heart level, the root of it. And then I'm going to recognize the way God sees it and look at it the way God sees it as spiritual adultery, that he is jealous of my love for him. And that leads, I think, to this really encouraging phrase at the beginning of verse 6. He says, but he gives more grace. But he gives more grace. Now, I'm one of those pastors that doesn't ask people to repeat things, you know, to say after me. But I feel like this is one of those times where I think we should. But he gives more grace. Say it with me. But he gives more grace. Guys, when we have hit the, the, the reality of our sin, when we've understood it and understood it from God's perspective, that is the moment for grace to come in. And that's where our third point is. How do we rid ourselves of sin at the root level? We have to respond with repentance. We've got to respond with repentance. Verses 6 through 10, let me read them. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. We have got to repent from the root of our sin. So what does the repentance look like? I've got five things that this text says. This. What does this repentance look like? First of all, it is humility. It says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It takes humility to admit it. 
that the root of my problem is a sin. The root of my problem maybe is fear. I don't trust God. Maybe the root of my problem is my pride, and I don't allow him to be king and Lord of my life. Number two, it's submission to God. Real repentance means submission to God. He says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. It's not what I want. It's not what Satan wants. It's, God, what do you want? I'm going to change my direction from going the direction that I wanted to go. I want to switch and go the way that you want to go. Third, it's drawing near to God. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. How many times does God say that phrase in the Old Testament? Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. It reminds me of the prodigal son story in Luke 15. You know, the father is looking out over the horizon, and he sees his son coming to him, and he runs to him. The son starts to draw and turn his heart towards his father, and the father jumps out and pursues his son. That's what God promises us. And this is really about our heart orientation. We can't hold our heart for another and then expect God to draw near to us. We've got to eject those things that are at the heart level and then turn our heart toward God. Number four, what does real repentance look like? We have to take real action. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. So, you know, when Israel would turn back to God in all the different times in the Old Testament where they walked away from God, and it wasn't enough that they just start worshiping God. They also had to destroy all the other idols. You can't hold on to the thing that you had before and expect to really be able to worship God. That's not real repentance. I've got to clean my hands up. I've got to cleanse my heart. I got to actually get those things out of my life. Maybe there's something you need to to kill. There's something that you need to get rid of even for a time and take real hard, serious action because that is not what I want anymore in my life. And, you know, that's why he calls it uh, being double-minded. You know, it'd it'd be like, I'm going to pick off the the leaves of the dandelion, but I'm going to intentionally leave the root in there because I kind of maybe want to come back to it. God wants us to dig it out, get rid of it. And then five, I think we need to feel the horror of our sin. He says, be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Real Repentance isn't sorry that you're caught. It's sorry. It is sorry that I have offended a holy God. That is real repentance. Understanding that this is spiritual adultery at the heart level. And then finally, in verse 10, we get the good news. The good news. We get forgiveness and we get exaltation. He says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. And so that's how we get rid of sin at the root level. We ID, we understand the real problem. We see the root of the sin the way God sees it. And then we respond with repentance. In the final two verses in 11 and 12, I'm going to call this the pass the test. How do I know? What's the proof that I've made some real progress at getting to the root and repenting from the root of my sin? Let me read 11 and 12. He says, do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? That is the proof that you've really gotten to the root of it. And here's why that's the proof. And here's why I would say that you've passed that test. Because if you have really identified the sin, you understand what the root is in your life, and you've seen it the way God has seen it, and you've really responded with repentance, how are you going to respond to other people? You know, that person that normally you've had a conflict with, normally you, you, you rub up against and you're just always bickering and arguing with them, or whatever it might be, you understand who the real lawgiver is. It's not you. 
You understand who the judge is. It's not you. You understand that your own failures and your own sin are as bad as anybody else. And you understand that you have been forgiven. You're in a real place of humility. So your response to other people is completely changed and transformed. You respond in love. When they come at you, you know, fists raised or the, the same all tone of voice, you now are filled with compassion and love for them and, and concern and care for where they are in their relationship with you, but with humility now because of what God has done for you. What God has done for you. So, so while we might want to protect and, and defend what belongs to us, we don't have to do that anymore. I don't have to protect my passions. Because go back to verse 10. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. I don't have anything I need to protect if God has exalted me. Why, why do I need to protect my desires if he has exalted me? Why, why do I need to protect my passions if he has exalted me? Listen to what God says through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 57, verse 15. He says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. And I just love the way Isaiah so often describes this holy, lifted up God. I mean, where does that God live? Where does he dwell? Well, he answers this with the rest of the verse. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place. It's like, yeah, that sounds exactly where that God would live. He says, and also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of of the contrite. If you want God to dwell with you and give you that kind of exalted revival in your life, I have got to allow the Holy Spirit to dig into the root at the heart level of my sin. So we're going to transition back to worship now. And this next psalm that we're about to sing I think hits these themes so, so well, and I'm looking forward to, to, to singing it with you. Let me pray. Lord God, give us a heart like heaven. Lord, let us be face down where mercy finds us. Give us broken hearts, God, because that is what you want. You are holy. You are God Almighty. God, burn in us a desire for you a passion worthy of you, God. Father, break our hearts with our spiritual adultery, God. Help us to see and know your jealousy for us, your jealousy that comes from your love for us and your passion for your image, God, that you have put into each and every one of us. Father, humble us. Father, exalt us now. As